I started teaching at Imperial and I kept going to the Outer Hebrides and I wrote some papers on my stuff there. And they drew a bit of attention. And in the late 70s, I was invited to a couple of USGS Red Book workshops in California. And America was completely new for me. I quite liked it. And uh, while I was there, I met a lot of people from the US Geological Survey earthquake group in Menlo Park. And the boss there was Barry Raleigh. And he was foolish enough to say, well, if you can get six months away, I'll find $10,000 for you to come to the earthquake office. So I thought that was a great idea because I knew that I needed to know more about what seismologists know about earthquakes. And I arrived in Menlo Park expecting to be given $10,000 and I was told to lock myself in an office and write a proposal for $10,000, which was very educational for me. Um, and I have to say that that was one of the rare proposals I've ever written where I actually did what I said I was going to do. But what I wanted to do was think about the depth control of earthquakes and continental crust because the Outer Hebrides structure had said that the really important thing is the transition to an active green schist metamorphic environment at temperatures of around 300, 350 Celsius, which is when fault rocks start flowing, so you get real mile marks. USGS, they were doing all these micro-earthquake surveys, little snap, crackle, pop, tiny earthquakes, magnitude 1, 2, 3, and there were catalogues of them that had never been published from different areas. Depth determination is the product of how dense the instruments are and how good your velocity model for the crust is. And, uh, but I taught myself the geophysics and I sorted out what I thought were the good ones. And you could see that earthquakes in California generally cut out at less than 20 kilometers, but mostly between 10 and 15 kilometers depth. And then I started looking at the heat flow data, and there was a wonderful man there called Art Lackenbrook, who was the guru of heat flow measurements. But there did seem to be uh, some correlation between regional heat flow and the depth of seismic activity. And you could model this in terms of the sort of simple uh, conceptual models of continental fault zones that I had started to develop in Scotland. And they made sense. And you could put in laboratory flow laws for quartz-rich rocks, and they sort of made sense. But I still had this basic theme that um, rocks in fault zones were giving useful information. So wandering around back in the British Isles, I kept finding hydrothermal veins in and around fault zones. And I didn't know much about that. But I had a lot of colleagues in the Royal School of Mines who did, and I worked with them. Uh, John Moore, otherwise known as Angus, uh, Andy Rankin, did fluid inclusion work, and uh, we actually wrote a very silly paper in 1975 that I think is, to put politely, a load of dingo's kidneys. And I've repeatedly said so but it keeps getting quoted. And it shows the mistake of putting a sort of a hip title, it was called seismic pumping. People like this, oh yes. Can't explain it any other way, seismic pumping will do it. <laughs> so you have to be aware of that. Anyway, I do believe that earthquakes pump fluids around, but not in the way that was specified in that paper. 